Thank you. Higher. And right on topic. <laughs> Good morning, church. It is a great joy to be with you this morning and to bring a word. Thank you for braving the elements, or at least the threat of elements that may come our way soon. I also want to say thank you for being a joyful, faithful, generous congregation. There is no other church in our whole region that is more faithful in giving to outreach than Central Christian Church Decatur. You change lives every day around the region and around the world by the gifts you give that get converted into God's life-changing love. That comes from here, and it's something that we can all be grateful for. I need to uh, announce publicly that Vicki and I are delighted to be members of Central Christian Church. We love it here. We're hugged on a regular basis. We're included in things. People just seem delighted to see us for some reason. And we love being a part of you. We love bringing our gifts and blending ours with yours. So I'm here to say we're all in. And we're delighted to be in this together with you, the members and friends of Central Christian Church. It's great to be together. Let's pray. Wonderful, merciful God, we're grateful for this time that we can draw near to you and to your word. We pray in these moments that you will open us anew, open our hearts and our minds, our eyes and our ears to receive you this day fresh word, a fresh lesson that will instruct us, will change us for the better. We are open, O oh God. We anticipate your presence and your power. Gratefully, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. For many years, when we lived in Eureka, Illinois, we commuted daily to Bloomington. I went to the regional church office Vicki and the girls went to a small private school called Blooming Grove Academy where Vicki was a teacher. Many of those years it was just Shalon and Vicki and I. Allison graduated and had gone to Eureka High School. So our routine, every weekday morning, climb in the car, Shalon in the back seat, buckle up, zonked out, sleeping the whole way to Bloomington. Wake up just in time to drag out of the car at the end of the trip. But one morning was different driving along, just getting to Bloomington, I look in the rearview mirror, and here is Shalon buckled into the middle seat and looking at the rearview mirror right at me. I said, well, I ought to be the good dad and engage her in conversation. So I said, Shalon, she's nine years old. I say, Shalon, what does God look like? And she says, well, He's an old man, and he lives in the clouds, and he's got white hair and a white beard because they're made of clouds. And I say, oh, you, you say he's old. How old is he? She goes, oh, about 100, but he doesn't look it. <laughs> Such a creative child. And then I ask, if God were to say something to you right now, what would that be? Immediately, she had an answer. And I said, and if God were to say something to your sister... Again, immediate. So the question that I asked Shalon is the question that I want to ask you today. If God were to speak a word to you right now, a phrase, a sentence, what might that word be? That's usually the response I get. No. <laughs> You, sometimes in church we will let people speak out, but in my asking that in the past, people have said things like, I love you, or be at peace, or get up and get busy. <laughs> All these kinds of phrases that we might attribute to God. So I say that to enforce, reinforce a conviction that I have that the most important question we can ask in our lives is, God, what are you calling us to do? And that's for individuals and for churches, that all of us need to be asking 
that question, looking for the answer. And I think that in the different times and stages of our lives, the answers to that question will change. So we need to repeatedly, often, be asking that question and seeking God's response and living our lives accordingly. And we see in today's gospel lesson an example of this for us. Jesus is in the synagogue. He's in his hometown. Now, there are some things that have happened to build up to that, and we should rewind and see what those things are. If we read Luke chapter 3, we see that that is the time of Jesus' baptism. And right after the baptism, he goes for 40 days in the wilderness, solitude on his own. The Bible says nothing to eat. And at the end of that 40 days, he was tempted by the devil. So it's right after those temptations that Jesus goes back to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and he goes to synagogue, as was his custom. A good habit for him, a good habit for us. And they ask him on that day if he would read scripture, kind of be the liturgist for that Sunday. So he stands up, and they hand him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he reads from what we know as Isaiah 58 and part of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news. Jesus is saying, I have been called by God for this. So he reads that scripture, rolls up the scroll, hands it back to the folks. Now, if his congregation was like the one that I grew up in in Edinburgh, there were some elderly ladies there elbowing one another saying, you know who that is? That's Joe and Mary's boy. He does such a nice job reading scripture, don't you think? They know him. Hometown boy is so proud of him. But after he hands over the scroll, he says, and you see this in Luke 4, these words have been fulfilled today in your hearing. What does that mean? He's saying, I claim these words for myself. The words that were spoken by the prophet, I'm claiming them. This is my ministry. This is what God is calling me to do, and this is what I will do. And if we read on, we see the hometown crowd saying, who does he think he is? He's a carpenter's boy. He's not from the prophets. This isn't who he is. And they weren't happy with him. But Jesus went public. He talked to his folks, saying, this is what I hear from God, and this is what I'm going to do. He made it clear. Friends, that's what it is for all of us, not just for Jesus, not just for ministers, but for all of us to ask and answer the question, God, what are you calling us to do? I got a call to ministry when I was about nine years old. I was at Barton Stone Home in Jacksonville leading worship. Now, you know, a kid this tall doesn't do a lot in leading worship besides read scripture and hand out communion. But I thought, this is cool. I could do this more. And 25 years after that, I became a minister. We listen, we respond. I know a guy who lives in St. Louis, used to work for the National Benevolent Association, one of our ministries of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and he was a maintenance man. Worked an eight to five, worked everything on the building, very pleasant, wonderful, did his job very well. And on the weekends, he owned a bus, and he put a kitchen in that bus, and he drove it around downtown St. Louis, giving out sandwiches to homeless people. Why do you think he did that? Nice guy? True. Called by God? Sure. Not a minister, but ministering to people, right? Each one of us has a call, a word from God that directs our lives, that gives us our talent and our power and our joy. This is what God wants us to do. How do we get there? How do we 
ask and answer that question. Is there an answer for you today? Hearing nothing, let me help out a little bit. (laughs) Some of you, I think, you know what God is calling you to do, and you're already doing it. Others might be saying, well, I haven't checked in in a while. Maybe I should do that. Frederick Buechner, wonderful spiritual writer, says, you will know what God wants you to do if you can answer these two questions. And I might mention there is room on your sermon notes if you want to write these down. Okay? Divert from grocery list to writing that. <laughs> Caught you. First question is this. What is the world's greatest need in your heart, in your mind? What is the world's greatest need? And the second question is this. What is your deepest joy? What is your deepest joy? What Buechner says is God is calling us to the intersection of the world's greatest need and our deepest joy. God wants us to live right there. And life changes, circumstances change. The answer to those questions will change over time. We need to ask often. We need to listen always to be connected with God. God knows our gifts. God knows our circumstances, and God can guide our hearts and our minds. So, for some of you, it may be clear now. For others of you, you will say, Scott, I really need to get back to you on that. And you can, and you can talk to the staff at the church and share the answers that you have, the leading that you have. God is calling each one of us to something unique and particular as individuals and as a church. So we ask as Central Christian Church, God, what are you calling us to do? In this day and in this time and with this cast of characters, What are you calling us to do? We bring these gifts. We promise to be faithful. A church is never better than when it is following God's calling. A number of years ago, I worked with a church in in Peoria. It's called Howitt Street Christian Church, a church about 75 years old, a church that average age of worship attenders, about 75 years old. And for all of these years, they had taken care of the building themselves. Even, you know, it's like three stories. They had put a roof on it. They had done everything inside and out, and they were simply not able to do that. And with about 15 or 20 people in worship on a Sunday, they couldn't afford to pay for it to be done. So they entered a period of discernment of asking God the question, what's in our next chapter together? And we held a series of what we called cottage meetings, going into homes, asking, what's been the best experience you've had as a part of the life of this church? And they told stories to one another, and they laughed, and they cried, and they prayed, and they decided together that they would sell their building for one dollar and that they would sell it to the ministry that they and others had given birth to some 30 years before, an organization called Commonplace. And in its beginning was a lot like Dove here in Decatur. So Commonplace bought the building for a dollar, and a member of the church actually gave the dollar to pay for the building. And the church got to stay in the building and continue to worship. And Commonplace did a capital campaign, raised almost a million dollars, and made the building handicap accessible. Put a lot more into the building than the church ever could. What a great gift. And you want to know what the miracle was? The vote to sell the church for a dollar was a unanimous vote. Have you heard of that? That's a miracle in the modern day. Thank you, Jesus. Howitt Street asked... God, what are you calling us to do? They listened and they responded in faith. So what is God saying to us here today 
at Central Christian Church. I hope we have an idea. Paul had an idea. Paul had a vision for this congregation, for all congregations, a vision of unity and diversity. And this is in Ephesians 4. I'm going to read this from the Message Bible. It's a, it's a contemporary language, and I think that reading it in a different way enlightens, enlivens different parts of a Scripture passage. So, reading from Ephesians 4. This is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. In light of all of this, here's what I want you to do. While I'm locked up here, a prisoner of the mas- for the master, I want you to get out there and walk. Better yet, run on the road God called you to travel. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. And mark that you do this with humility and discipline, not in fits and starts, but steadily pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love, alert at noticing differences, quick at mending fences. You are all called to travel on the same road in the same direction, so stay together, both outwardly and inwardly. You have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who rules over all, works through all, and is present in all. Everything you are and think and do is permeated with oneness. But that doesn't mean that you should all look and speak and act the same. Out of the generosity of Christ, each of us is given his or her own gift. He handed out gifts above and below, filled heaven with his gifts, filled earth with his gifts. He handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor-teacher to train Christians in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient and graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive like Christ. That's what the gospel, the good news is saying to us. We're all in this trip together. We're all moving together. We're all bringing our gifts. It is our work as God's faithful to know our gifts, to share our gifts, to blend our gifts. Does this sound familiar? Gretchen's sermon two weeks ago? Bring your gifts to church with you, not just your wallet or your checkbook, but who God created you to be. When God gives a gift, God wraps it in a person. You are that gift for us and for others. God is calling this congregation to great things. This has long been a great congregation. This church has been made a gift to us by all those who have gone before us. And we're called to make it a gift to this generation and the next and the next. And not just those who would dare come in those doors, but we're called to be a gift to this neighborhood and to this community and to God's world. We need to be listening together. I've led visioning and planning with about a hundred churches and not-for-profits in the last 20 plus years. And I see great things coming, not just a vision and a ministry plan, but spirit and enthusiasm and togetherness and joy that comes in that, the energy, the fuel to drive that vision. It's a new day in the life of Central Christian Church. And if we want to pull together and we want help doing that, I'm here to help. Others are here to help. When we figure that out, we can be no more blessed as individuals and as church, asking and answering what is God calling us to do. So in the days and weeks ahead, I hope you'll continue 
to give some thought to the question, what is God's calling on my life and in the life of our congregation? It is our work to ask the question, to listen and figure it out, and to respond in faith. And I encourage us to claim that and to live that for the glory of God. Let's pray. God, we know you as great and powerful. We know that you live within us and among us, and we are grateful that we see you in the eyes of each person we meet. God, you know the promise that lives within us because you put it there. Help us to discover the gift of vision, the power of moving forward together, of being unified, of all of us bringing our gifts and being the church you call us to be. God, we are so grateful. Our hearts overflow. We pray to you in that gratitude. In the name of Jesus, amen.